uh, and and thank you. thank you everyone for for joining and 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 listening to me. Uh, hopefully, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, at the end of the session, we can we can say it's gonna be interesting. Um, so basically, what what Chris said, I'm I'm working for for MVP School of Coaches uh, over here in 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 Barcelona, Spain. Uh, I'm originally from from Belgium. Uh, I used to coach in in Club Brugge, uh, the academy of the club, and also in a, in another first uh, division club over there before joining MVP back in 2019. Uh, the year before uh, before COVID is going to be in, in the next thousand years going to be that famous before Christ, uh, Jesus Christ. But before COVID, that was also uh, a good year to, to make that move. I'm going to um, sh uh, share my screen um, because we prepared a small presentation. And again, if there's any questions at some point, uh, just just let me know. Uh, we will will do a Q and A uh, afterwards if there is any question. So let's see if the technology is on our side. We tried it, but there's nothing better than live moments. So let's see. All right. So I have to accept this. All right. Wait. wait. Let's wait a second because I have some Zoom stuff over here. All right. You can see the screen, right, Chris? All right, perfect. So, so today's topic is is about should we adapt the game to the player or the player to the game? All right. So, what we're gonna explain in the next um next forty five minutes more or less is the way that we look towards to the game. All right, from MVP's point uh, or, or perspective. Before starting, uh, I just wanna wanna explain who we are and and what. Is our vision on the game all right uh before we start with with the topic so basically we started back in 20 uh i would say 2007 uh almost uh well almost 17 years ago uh we start working and in investigating the game also because we we saw that there was a, a need of, of a, from a science perspective also to understand the game and we we came up with with four questions which are to be honest, daily life questions. But as a coach, and especially as a youth coach, those questions are easy, but the answers on those questions are not that easy. And a lot of coaches are going towards the pitch without having clear the answer uh, on, on those questions. So four questions, what do I need to train? And this is what we're gonna have. This is the retro throughout the presentation also. What do I need to train? What do I need to give to my players to make them better players? How do I need to train it? And this is something where we coaches, we are most comfortable on the green pitch. On, on, on the green grass, we we are the most, we are the happiest over there. But a lot of us coaches, we are going to the pitch and we don't know what we want to train. So if we don't know the answer on the first question, what content we want to train, we are not going to make sure that we have the most optimized uh, context for our players. So the what question is very important to proceed with the how question, the methodology part of the of our uh, method. Then the when is is something that we're gonna touch a lot. Planning and programming. When do we need to do that? Everybody knows that in high performance, that the day before for a game you shouldn't train high intensity. Yeah, but. When should we train certain things? When should we train? Uh, when should we not train certain things? So we're gonna start planning and programming, and also depending on the the, the development zone of the players, can we train this uh, certain skills at that age or not? And why do I need to train that? So the why basically is the fourth question, but for me is the boss of all questions. Uh, because if we don't ask ourselves why we need to train that content, why we need to train it in that certain way, and why we need to train it at that certain point or not, it's we we are lost basically. So that's the way that we look towards the game with those answering those four questions. That was the starting point for for us. We have developed a methodology which is uh, so so it names uh, MVP making better players, making better professionals, or making better people also. Because in the end, as a youth coach or as a coach in general, we have the uh, power to create better players, but also better human beings, better people. And this is something that we sometimes underestimate uh, the power that we have with, with that. So 
from from youth side, from the little ones, four, five years old until the player gets retired. We work with also with fundamentals. Uh, we're gonna see see some some of it, and especially in the next webinar, we're gonna highlight a little bit more. But in in the high performance stage with fundamentals, we refer to the most tactical or the most common tactical situation where we give the most optimized answer to that situation. Doesn't mean that there's only one answer to a certain situation. No, but by investigating thousands of times that situation, we give the most optimized one. And within the huge stages. We well within high performance, we have 171 fundamentals at this point. Within six months, it might be one more or two more because the game is in constant evolution. But within the huge stages, we're talking about individual basic fundamentals. And this is where we have around 350 concepts, uh, more or less. So this is just to give a context on what we're gonna see uh and, and where we, we are coming from. Uh we are a, applying our, our expertise by coaching education and also works with, with federation and, and professional clubs all around the world. But more importantly, what's on the menu? So we gonna see the why, what, and when and how question. All right. So when I said it was gonna be the red thread, it's gonna be the red thread throughout the whole presentation. All right. So let's start. Do we adapt the game to the players or the players to the game? We should ask ourselves, and this is just to, to start uh, with the topic, do we have to adapt the game to the players or make them adapt to the game? Very important. First question that we're going to have. It's a collective sport. Everybody knows it's our 11 aside, 7 aside, 9 aside. It's a collective sport. It's not like tennis. You play a one against one. But can it be trained individually? And third question, is the biological age a key aspect to train our players? So I'm going to show right now three examples of uh, Spanish Catalan football. Um, there's no difference between Spanish and Catalan football. The only thing is because it's a Catalan region. And if not, my, my wife, who's downstairs, she's going to be mad if I'm not saying that it's Catalonia. Uh, so it's a national thing. But let's start with the first example. Those are the little ones, all right? The little ones over here, we're going to see different behaviors. Uh, so in Spain, we play seven a side on, for me, to be honest, quite a big uh, space. But we're going to see the behaviors of, of, of these players. So this one is a video of one uh, minute and 30 seconds, some, something like that. So if you see, and I'm just going to stop for a second, we see about... Well, 14 players, the goalkeeper's on the left, goalkeeper on the right, stayed on his line. And probably we see about eight, nine players just running towards the ball, running towards the ball. So, and shooting. And you would say that's going to be an awesome pass, which is by the way, an awesome pass. But this one, he, I don't think that the player realized that he should score in the on, on the right side and not on the left side. But this is something that we shouldn't play uh, the players. It's something that we're going to see in, in, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So there's a lot of behaviors. In, in Dutch, we say it's like a bunch of bananas. It's all like flies to, to food. They are all packed together. They just want to have the ball, basically. And when when they score a goal, parents are applauding. So, so that's the reaction with those little kids, which is, by the way, a great tackle, this one also. It looks like Sergio Ramos in his prime. Uh, but we see different behaviors which are very synchronized, uh, very individual. They give some passes. They start to understand that there's players with the same jersey that they might be able to trust, uh, but they're not sure. They don't know how to coordinate those, those passes. So that's all for, for the first video. So those are the, the youngest uh, youngest one almost in, in, in Catalonia, Spain. Second one, same club, same environment, uh, but older, uh, an older category. So what we see over here is that the game is going to be a little bit more synchronized. The players, they are not like the flies on, on food again. They are not going to hunt the ball all at the same time, they know a little bit more the position. They know that it's a collective sport. So they start understanding 
that they can move synchronized. Then, for example, this player doesn't like the ball at all. So he just uh, shoots it away. So we start seeing some, some behavior as a collective over here. And then, well, and in the central lane, we always have the, the, we always put a little bit the better players over here. And then last example that we're going to see is from the highest level uh, at under 16, uh, which is uh, Espanol against Corinna in, in this example. And then the other examples is also what we call Division Honor, which would be, for example, in MLS next level, which are the under 16s of, uh, of clubs, uh, might be professional clubs like Espanol, first or second division, or might be the top academies of, of the whole state, basically. And this is what we're going to see that it's purely collective uh, collective game. It's very synchronized. Even the execution at some points is not from the highest level. This pass is going to be amazing, by the way. He sees the space. He knows this one can go out wide to the right. He sees that the defender from the other team is, is, is covering it. Over here, the same. He turns. He switches play. And he finds a space over here with the left back at this point. So this is something that we see. If we go back to those questions and we go to towards the next slide, after watching all these, these videos, are they all the same? Because it's the same game. It's, it's the same sport, basically. So are they all the same or not? Do they have to train in the same way? Do we have to train the players from the last video as in the same way as we sh should train? the little ones that we saw in the first video, or when is the best moment to train some contents? When when do you start training switch of play, for example? What we saw in the first video, uh, we didn't see at all. In the second video, uh, we saw some intentions maybe to, towards finding the space and, and some players were able to execute that. And in the third video, we saw a lot of players. We The two examples were, were amazing, switch of play. And how do you have, they have to be trained, all right? So as a coach, what well, we should ask ourselves, the biological age, and this is the way that we look to the game, does not determine the level of development of the players. Because in the same videos that we saw, there was different types of players, a level of players. For example, we were in the second video and we already saw some signs of synchronizations within the team. They know how what to do. And then there was that blue player that just kicked away the ball. But he's at the same age. So he's at the same age. So in our hands and the structure that we need also as a coach, I have it in the eight group. They're all in their eight. Perfect. That's correct. But they might be not at the same level. The typical thing that happens in a lot of teams that we have, I don't know, 10, 15 kids. Let's say that we have 10 kids. Two of them are outstanding, amazing players, higher than, than the average. We have two horrible players or two not that well developed players because we call them horrible, but they might not be horrible. They just might need a little bit more time because we're talking about kids, let them make mistakes. And then we have two, two, and then we have six in the middle that are the average. But the biological age doesn't determine, determine the level of development of the place. What does the term is how they understand the game. How they understand the game, and the second part of this sentence is how they enjoy while they are playing. And especially in grassroots and youth football, we should let make sure that our players, and even, even in high performance, that they enjoy playing, playing the game. It's the most important thing, because why is there a huge dropout, not only in the US, but in Spain, in Belgium, and in a lot of under, other countries, at the age of 12, 13, because they lost the sense of, of joy, of, of, of making fun. So the fun concept is a very, very, very important one in order to, in, to create the most optimized environment for the players. So we're going to start working, uh, or, or our perspective is, let's treat every player as an individual. And it's, it's a very difficult task as, as a coach, because, and this it's just an example, but imagine that we are coaching an under-8 team or an under-10 team 
and from different countries all around the world. So the only thing that they all have in common is that they are 10 years old. But imagine working in different countries, and we've seen that firsthand. The context is very different from an American kid than with a Belgian kid, for example, or with a Spanish kid. And imagine the context of a kid in Arizona with Flagstaff, for example, in Phoenix and Flagstaff, or with Connecticut, which is, to be fair, it's the same country. So people think, and we coaches are tempted to think, no, he's an American kid. This, 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 this is the way to develop. Yeah, but the American kid might have a Mexican father, an African mother, might have different origins and might have a different context than any other player in the, in, in the group. So it's a collective sport, but we should, especially in the development stages, we should focus on the individual and we should try to develop the individual the maximum possible. That's the only thing that we have in common. But this is perfect. This, this all sounds, sounds amazing, but it, it sounds very difficult because, again, I have an under-10 team. I have 10 players. I have 10 pairs of parents that are, are, are asking me to develop their player their son, their daughter. Perfect. How do we do that? How can we optimize our training environment when we work with a team, with a collective? How can we optimize it towards an individual part? So what we do is, and as we mentioned before, what we're going to look at is the game understanding of the players, all right? And we're going to div divide that into three stages, Every stage has sub-stages, and this is what we're going to talk about uh, in the next slides. The first one is the egocentric. So the first example that we saw, that was, those were players, almost all of them, except for one who would be able to create a little bit of doubts that was passing in an egocentric stage. So we have egocentric zero, one, and two. What does it mean, egocentric? The name itself, it says, he or she doesn't understand the concept of playing together. It's as simple as that. And let's go to, to one of my favorite examples. Imagine that we are all five years old. So all, everyone on, 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 on the call is again, kid, five years old. And I'm the one with a, ba a bag of candies. I'm the fortunate one. As, as Jose Mourinho one, I'm, I'm the special one. I'm the candy man right now. And Chris comes to me and Chris, little Chris asked me for, for a candy. But I'm in an egocentric stage, not only in football or soccer, not only in general, I'm five years old. I don't understand the concept of sharing. So I'm sorry, Chris, not gonna share my candy with you. But then my mom comes in and she says, Thomas, share your candy with Chris. The fact, She's my mom. I have to listen. And it's it's an aura. It's kind of an aura. We are able to connect the dots over there to, okay, my mom's saying that, someone that has authority. Perfect. I'm going to share my candy with Chris. My mom goes away. Chris loves my candy. Asks for, uh, for another one. And I'm going to say again, no, Chris, I'm sorry. I'm not sharing my candy. You already had one, which is one less for me. Let's translate that example towards the game. When do people applaud during the game? At the age of, uh, when, when we see a game of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, or when do we start rewarding players? When are the typical example of a grandparent or a parent paying $1 per goal of his own kid? This is the typical example in the US and in, in Belgium and in, in, in Spain, everywhere around the world, because it's, and the kid knows that, all right, I'm going to score a goal. I'm going to score a goal and I'm getting rewarded in some kind of way. Might be candy, might be dollar, might be applause, because that's the first sign that we relate at that age, because we are very sensitive at, at the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine years. We are very sensitive and very easy and, and fast learning. So the fact that I'm making a goal immediately, our hair applause, I want to repeat that. And they applause again. I want to repeat that. So we don't understand in an egocentric stage, we don't understand the concept of playing together. 
So we are trying to reach our own, our own individual goal. We say that this stage can be with players. Again, we are not talking about biological age, but th there might be a player of 13 years old that still has some egocentric characteristics. Might be, might be. It shouldn't, but it's possible. Doesn't mean that it's a bad player. No, he just might need some more time in his individual development. While they're on the other hand, a kid of seven years old, next Messi, whatever they want to call it, he might be in another stage that we're going to see right now, summative, or a player of 13, 14 might be in collective already, which is the last stage. So it depends on the game understanding of the kid. What are the characteristics and short one and in a resume of summative? So if we pass the egocentric two stage, we go into the stage of summative. It says we are leaving the egocentric part. We still have it present, obviously, but we are feeling more comfortable in a group. I see uh, that, for example, James is wearing the same shirt as I do. I might be able to trust James. I might be able to trust. All right. This is starting at the egocentric two state. I'm starting to trust players with the same jersey because I understand that if he scores a goal, they will also applaud, and we will maybe able uh, we will be able to, to win the game. So that's perfect. So I start understanding the concept of playing together, and the actions in the game are understood as a result of connecting uh, different individual behaviors. So that's a very important stage. Players around fourteen years might be in summative one or two stage. Also, it's it it depends a little bit. It depends on the level. It depends on the context. It depends on on on, on the individual development of the players. And then the ultimate goal, and, and we're high-performance players, uh, players in MLS or, 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 or in, in, in professional leagues, reach that, that stage at least, is collective. And we're starting, we're playing as a team, and almost all players that are playing in the first uh, team, not professionally or, or uh, semi-professional, for example, they are able to reach that stage. But... It's collective already. So we are playing as a team. We know the cooperation during the game is the main characteristic of the of the stage. So we're dividing that into those three stages with the sub stages over here. All right. How we how do we do that? So basically, depending on the game understanding, so depending on the stage where the player is, we're gonna prioritize certain contents above other ones. So for example, this one. We have always a basic content block and a complementary content block. We're going to divide that in certain skills. This one is a very easy uh, example on, on initiation site, uh, site, so egocentric. And what we see, for example, we were talking about a player that doesn't understand the sense of playing together. So what we see in orange, I don't know, I can show my, my mouse over here, but uh, what we see in orange are the abilities or the skills that we should develop. The ones that are in gray are the ones that we should try to trigger step by step. So pass, for example, pass is not an orange at this point. It's something that we should say, running with the ball, shielding the ball, beating an opponent. Perfect. Let's start with a pass whenever we have the time and planning, start planning it. All right. So obviously coordination, cross, Let's talk, not talk about a cross until he, he knows what a pass is and, and everything like that. So depending on the stage of game understanding where the player is at, we're going to start prioritizing certain contents. All right? Okay. So justifying the method, talking about the principles of the educational psychology, very important. We have to adapt the game to the players. All right? So that was the question at the beginning. We say... Let's try to adapt the game to the players as much as possible. Why well, it's always the same game. It's football. So, so it's football. You have to score in one goal and you have to defend the other one. It's as simple as that. But how can we adapt towards the players and their individual needs and, and requirements? Game space. Make the space, especially with the little ones. And this is something that I like very much in Belgium. They play two aside at in the six. With the goalkeeper is fixed for two minutes. And so they are playing 
goalkeeper plus one against goalkeeper plus one, which is amazing. Why? Lots of touching the ball for the player that is attacking. I don't know why Zoom is is, is putting on my thumbs, but um, very important. A lot of players have the ball, so so it's very short, very high chances to score goals, to have success, what they really want. Beating opponent, what we saw was very important. So reduce the game space whenever it's necessary. Number of players. If we know that we are in an egocentric state, maybe it doesn't make sense to play 11 aside. Maybe it doesn't make sense to play 5 aside because they still don't have the concept of playing together. So we have to reduce the amount of player or increase the amount of player, depending on what stage we are. Competition, make it fun, make it competitive also in a certain way. Not towards results only. So not winning the games on Saturday is not the ultimate goal. It's part of the process. Ball size. I don't know in, in the US, uh, but and I can only imagine it's, it's the same as, as in Europe. We have different size of the ball. All right, perfect. Let's work with it. Let's give smaller balls to towards um, towards the little ones. The goal size, adjust it. And the trainings. Also, make it more affordable or more accessible towards the players. So we try to adapt the game towards the players. Division of the program into periods, all right? So we were talking about the game understandings, stages, and then we talk about four, uh, four periods. Adaptation, initiation, technification, and high performance. Very important that we're going to remember those ones in the next uh, few slides because... We're going to talk about adaptation together with egocentric. So we're going to start mixing up some, some of the concepts. There we go again. That was the second question. Can it be trained individually or should it always be collectively? Let's try individually. The more we get in towards the third and fourth period, the more collective it gets. So very important. The more we go to high performance, the less importance the individual has, because at first it's 100%, let's call it that way, 100% to nothing. Second stage, 90-10. Third stage, it starts 50-50 maybe, I'm, I'm bad with numbers, but the importance of the individual development is, is going now, while the collective is, is growing. We also see that if we go back to the stages, we're saying, okay, we are leaving the individual part behind. We're starting to understand the game. We understand that it's a collective sport. So this is very important uh, for us as coaches to have in mind that at the early stages, every player should have a ball, for example. Simple example. And then the last one, consideration of the motivation. When we talk about the fun part again. So make sure that it's understandable contents. Uh, because there's nothing so frustrating for us as coaches when we try um, to do or to to duplicate or or to to show a Pep Guardiola exercise that we or training drill that we saw on YouTube, which is uh, I love Pep Guardiola, I love him, but until I don't get on my training session three players like Kevin De Bruyne, Erling Haaland, well maybe bad example, but Bernardo Silva. I'm not able to do the same exercises as he does, even if he's a great coach. I should, if I even consider of replicating those exercises towards my context, I should simplify them by a thousand to make sure that my players understand the contents. Game similar to the competition, very important is we're going to talk about the pre football stage and very important positive, uh, positive relationship between players and coach. Again, with those understandable contents, it's very important because we're getting frustrated as a coach if something doesn't work, but only a few of us ask why it doesn't work. And maybe it's not because of the players. Maybe it's because the players are just not ready also. But we should know that. We should know perfectly in what stage the players are in order to create the best environment for them. So those are the principles for, for us. All right. Training content. All right. Let's go to the egocentrical one stage. All right. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit on, on, on this part. If there's any questions afterwards, just let me know. There are two sub-stages, all right, which depend 
on the needs of the players and depends on they have coordinative deficiencies very complicated word for me sorry and they might have difficulties to understand the internal logic of the game scoring in one goal defending another for example the rules of the game in case they have both they are in an egocentric zero free football basically they don't understand anything about the game that happens to me with American football. Is that because I'm not smart? No, I just don't know. I just don't know about American football. And that happens to little kids. So we shouldn't get frustrated with the kids that they don't understand the internal logic of the game. If they only, if they understand the logic of the game, but uh, they have some coordinative problems, they will be egocentrical, zero football, all right? So they already start playing football. But then again, how do we know that? So with MVP, we developed simple tests, which in this case, the test ego zero, uh, consists out of two phases. Phases one are two coordinate circuits that we just apply and we measure the time. We measure if they do it correctly because it has a certain amount of capacity, intellectual capacity of the game also. And then we analyze them during a game, their characteristics, and to say, okay, perfect, he's in that stage or not. And we can do that if we start planning those content throughout the season, we can do that every three months, for example, to make sure that your players are progressing so you can measure it as a coach, but to make sure that they are still in the same stage or not. So we can personalize the content towards their own needs. Two types of players, as we said. So we go zero pre-football, ego zero football, in case they understand the, the logic of the game, all right? Contents to train during the adaptation period. So we were talking about adaptation and egocentric zero. So again, we are, when I was referring to a block of uh, specific contents and a block of basic contents, we talk about a block of enhancing contents, all right? So depending on what stage they are, we're gonna prioritize more certain contents over others. For example, basic model skills and specific model skills, we're gonna, it's a basic content for us in order to, to make sure that it works for them. All right, so this is something that we start planning the minute we know in what stage of, of game understanding the players are at. All right, initiation period. So adaptation, we're probably talking about egocentric, all right? Well, high likely it's only egocentric. When we talk about the second period out of four that we have, we start with initiation. We might talk about egocentric one, two, summative one, and two, all right? Again, how do we determine in what stage they are? Player game understanding. So we're going to uh, analyze the four roles during competition. Team game understanding. So we're going to compare the players between each other or within each other to see, all right, at what level is that player at? At what player uh, or what level is my team at? What stage? And then the skill level test that we are doing. All right. So according to that, we will be able to say, all right, that player, Michael, for example, is eager to Chris. Ego two, Raul, Suma one. Perfect. So Raul is maybe better than average, might be. Or he's just, he has a better game understanding at this point. All right. So this is important. We, we start developing those tests. And then something that, that we as coaches, I think we, we, we need to consider and we need to have that in, in, in mind every single session that we do our uh, Vygotsky came up with, with a certain theory about, uh, theory about the cognitive growth and human learning as a social process. So we're talking about different zones, all right? So we were talking about the zone of actual development. So we were talking about those little kids, six, seven years old, egocentric. What is their zone of actual development? Is it passing? It isn't. Is it scoring goals? It is. Is it beating their opponent? Probably it is, or at least I should start trying it, all right? So we have to make sure that the content that we are giving towards our players 
is in the zone of actual development and not in the next zones that we're going to see. We have the second zone, which is the zone of proximal development. So that was in terms of the content that we saw earlier uh, with scoring, shielding the ball, pass in gray was in the proximal development. We should start trigger step by step those certain skills. But we have to make sure that we understand as a coach that it's not in his actual development. It's in his next one. So it's it's coming. We're getting closer. And our job as, as a coach is to make sure that the proximal development in a few months is his actual development. So that the player makes a progress, makes improvement throughout uh, his, his, his career, basically. And the next stage that is frustrating for everyone when we are asking to egocentric players to do a possession games and pass the ball 10 times, That's then, then we're talking about zone of potential development, but maybe in five years. So we shouldn't, in, uh, in order to avoid frustration from the kids and from ourselves, we should focus, especially on the green side, a little bit on the orange side and about the red, let's make sure that it becomes orange in a few months and make sure that it becomes red at a certain point. That's the only cons uh, uh, consideration that we have to make over there, all right? So that theory of Vygotsky is, is something that we, we try to implement in everything that we, we do over here. Okay, I'm gonna skip that one quickly. Again, if we start talking about adaptation and initiation period, we talk about the different blocks again, all right? So we're talking about the central, uh, the, the sub-stages below, and we start, the more that we go to the right, if we go to summative stages, we start introducing some collective basic fundamentals, all right? Some collective behaviors so that players understand what it's going to be about uh, the game about. For example, switching the play is one of them. For example, it's it's step by step. We are trying to to introduce that. Again, when we are going to um, to to technification high performance, we're talking about players in the stages or sub stages of summa two, collective one, and collective two. Again, we have a test similar to the one that we had with with the previous sub stages. We do a player game understanding test. And we do a team game understanding. So we can measure where the player is at in comparison with other players of his age, basically. All right? So you can tell that in the different stages, starting from egocentric to summative and collective, we work in the same way. We develop those tests by scientific research in order to make it first accessible, but also measurable for coaches to say, all right, perfect. Chris is at that stage. I should start prioritizing this type of content with him. All right. Talking about technification and high performance. All right. In high performance, the, the game model and especially in high performance and, and both, uh, both high performance as technification, the game model is going to be very important. Within egocentric stages, let's not talk about a game model. That's Please don't talk about it. We should start developing by technification when we start playing 11 aside, for example. We start, and de depending on how our game model is uh, built, the game IDs, the principle of play, the sub principles of play also, we start developing certain skills uh, rather than others. So, so that's a block that comes in. So we have the uh, basic block as usual, as we saw in the other stages also. The basic individual ball uh, and individual fundamentals with ball, without, and some basic collective fundamentals. Then we have the complementary blocks, which are more towards skills, pers uh, perceptive, coordinative, and, and space. And then we start with specific blocks of content, which might be individual fundamentals per position, some line, which are collectives, and universal also. And the game model is a fourth step over here. And this is something that we, we already said. So basically, when we go back to adaptation and, and initiation, by defining the game understanding, and this is just as a resume, defining 
the game understanding stage of the player, we will be able to classify the contents and prioritize them. And those five important steps. First, prioritize, as I've mentioned already a thousand of times. Then we should order them in a, in, in a logical way. Sequence them. Make sure that we connect all of them, especially in the initiation period, which is very important, and temporize them. Also very important to make sure that everything goes well, set some objectives in terms of, of timing uh, periods also. Then within game uh, or within high performance and technification, as I mentioned, the game model is going to influence the way that we, we want to develop, right? So that's important because again, in high performance and depending on the context, in some clubs, you're able with an under 14, you're training three times a week. In some clubs, you're able to train four times a week. Um, so depending on the weekly microcycles, we will be able to also optimize certain skills and abilities in, in terms of, of other ones. All right. Last one. And this is the, when we were talking about the four question, I said that we cannot go into the how question when we don't know the what and the when basically also. So the when question, we go towards what we saw with, with those stages, substages, egocentric, collective, uh, summative between the two of them. So we start knowing, okay, perfect. My player is in that, that stage. Those players are in that stage. All right, perfect. What type of content do I need to train them? So those two questions are already related. And as the next step, when we go to the how question, the methodological part. So the methodological part is when we start doing training sessions. Again, when, when we touch the, the holy grass, the green grass, where we coaches are most comfortable. So with didactic strategies, we with, with the MVP uh, team, we developed or we believe that there are 16 of them. Doesn't mean that there's 17. For example, I'm not a big fan of Rondo, which sounds strange. I'm not a big fan of it. I, I think it's it, I think it's amazing, but I don't think it's it's very useful to train certain things. So I'm 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 not a big fan of it in general. Do I use it? Yeah, I do. Sometimes at least. Because some players need a rondo for certain things. But within didactic uh, strategies to use in adaptation and initiation, for example, we can use some general games. We can use some very specific games, possession games, real conditioning games, and we can use the internal logic games that we saw, but only in, 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 the, in the first part. So they understand the internal logic of the game. Then something that we saw as, as, a, as a summary, what we saw with the uh, psychology is how can we, perfect, we did define the perfect or the, the best strategy to train, to do that training session, how can we adjust them? How can we trigger one player more than another or not that much as another? Perfect. Physical elements, reduce the space, make it larger, uh, larger reduce the time, make it, make it longer in time also. The rules, roles of the players, we might uh, use a neutral player, we might not. Sometimes that player, Chris might be a perfect neutral player because he understands the game while Thomas isn't. Perfect. Um, makes sense that the coach puts me in the middle as a neutral player. Makes sense depending on the objective of the training session also. Depending if, if he wants to get me out of my comfort zone, get me out of my development zone, actual development zone, and trying to go to, go to the next uh, development zone. Might be. Might be with Chris that it's a different object. All right, perfect. Game spaces. Again, scoring. Scoring is a very easy factor that we can we can improve a lot. If we are asking, for example, typical, typical exercise, we are asking our wingers to cut into to the box in the last... 20 meters, perfect. How can we reward them, for example? How can we make sure that they do that behavior that we are asking or wishing them to do? Double points, triple points, maybe even five points at some point. But make sure that when we do, or when we are rewarding something, remember what we said about the kid and, and the parents applauding. 
that it makes sense that he's executing at least the behavior that we as a coach want to see and that he or she develops. So we should reward that what we want to see and not everything what we want to see. Basically, objective. Set one or two objectives throughout the training session and make sure that everything that we do is concrete towards that uh, objective. Even with scoring. Teaching strategy. Uh, there's a lot of coaches that, that and, and I made that mistake when, when I was young, uh, in, in the beginning years of, 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 of my career, um, I was I was trying to tell the players throughout the whole game what they should do. Now, Chris, move to the right. Oh, impossible. Frustrating for me because they didn't listen. And then afterwards, I said, maybe they, they were listening, but maybe it's just impossible to listen also. Maybe it's not that they are not willing to listen to me. But maybe it's just impossible because of the context where we're playing, a lot of noise, different uh, impulses of, of everything. They, they are concentrated on the game. They are not able to combine a lot of things. So it's we changed towards guided discovery. All right. Guided discovery is, is a problem. Uh, and we had tons of conversation. I think we had a conversation with, with Chris about that a few months ago at the convention that it's a problem not only in the game. But we don't, in, in society in general, in life, we don't allow ourselves. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a dad. I, I don't have kids. Uh, and we don't allow our kids, basically. And I'm bad positioned over there. But we don't allow our kids making mistakes. And I think some of the things that we should do, it's just about the game. So let them enjoy. So let them make mistakes. Let them learn from those mistakes. Let's try to correct that behavior, but let them discover it. Let them discover it. When they kick the ball in, in, in the wrong way, they will know that it's wrong. So don't only highlight what's wrong, highlight also what's, what's positive. So when we are talking about the, the, the psychology part of, of the game, make sure that we have a positive relationship with, with the players because... If a player, I'm I'm 30 years old right now. I only remember two coaches of the of my 18 years of of player uh, career that I had, the bad one, and and the good one, and I remember better the bad one than the good one. But as coach, as a coach, we have the power. What we said in the beginning, to make better players because that's our objective. That's why parents are asking to the club, hey. I want you to develop my kid. That's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters for them. They want their kid to be happy, to develop. But we are able, and, and the percentage of, of players going to professional football is not even 0 0.01. It's even less. It's even less than that. So the chances of a kid becoming professional, to be completely fair with all of you guys, and you know that, it's very low. So at some point, he's not going to be a player anymore. He might be coach or he might be still a player and coaching. But we have the power as a youth coach, as a grassroots coach, to make better people. And this is something that by your behavior, by your, your communication, by everything that we do, we should have that in account in order to complete with that or to fulfill and accomplish that objective. Because as a coach, we do have the power to, to make them a better human being, which goes way beyond the game, way beyond the game. So we try to apply, and, and long story short, try to apply the guided discovery, all right? Which is, let them make mistakes also. Let them make mistakes. Make sure that we don't say everything that they should do. Let them make mistakes. Let them explore. There's nothing more fun than explore the game. It's it's nothing more fun. Let let them shoot with the left foot when, when, while they shoot uh, shoot with their right foot. Let them do that. Guide the discovery. Let them. Let's create an environment where they can make mistakes, learn from it, and optimize that environment for them. All right. Well, basically that that that's it for today. I hope Chris, I didn't take it too long i think 45 minutes something like that 
Um, but yeah, any any questions, any any question that comes up afterwards, uh, you you can email me or or ask Chris. Uh, my 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 number is over there uh, or send an email. So any questions? And I, I truly hope that you guys uh, enjoyed the way that we look um, to towards the game.